Join us now for Bible Tract Echoes. This program is the radio ministry of Bible Tracts Incorporated, founded in 1928 by evangelist Paul Levine and dedicated to getting the gospel of Jesus Christ to the whole world. Here today with a special message from God's Word is Mark Smith. Mark is the director of Bible Tracts Incorporated. And now, our Bible teacher, Mark Smith. Hello, my dear friend. Thank you for joining us on this, the Tuesday edition of Bible Tract Echoes. I have my Bible open to the book of the Psalms and Psalm 25 in particular. If you listened to yesterday's broadcast, uh, I said that we were coming here today. We'll be here probably today and tomorrow. And if you did not hear yesterday's broadcast, I'll tell you in a moment how you can re rehear that or hear it for the first time, I guess. Uh, we would like to very much to put into your hands some tools to help you communicate the gospel. And before we get uh, into the texture in Psalm 25, let me say that I would like you to be ready to write down a, a one of the ways you can get a hold of us here at Bible Tracks Incorporated. That's the arm, that's the ministry that produces Bible uh, Track Echoes. Bible Tracks Incorporated, since 1938, has been producing good gospel tracks uh, to help people share the gospel with the lost people around them. We do this in different languages. It is our ministry to uh, print these tracks for free and give them away. We pay the shipping. We want to help you have the tools. It is our burden that no servant of the Lord be in want of tools to help them communicate the gospel to, or to others around them. So we would like to put into your hands, if we haven't already, uh, some tracks. I would like to send you a sample packet, and it's free. Yes, sir, it is free, and uh, i like you to take it and read it, see the tracks that are there, and then you can look at ordering from us, and again, we give tracks away. One of the tracks in that sample packet has just been used to see countless people come to Christ. It's entitled, What About Eternal Life? What about eternal life? Now, so many people have heard about eternal life. It's a word that's very, very frequently used in churches. And even lost people have talked about, have heard the term eternal life. This track adds, answers the question, well, what about it? What is it? And it's a, it's a great question. We need to answer, why does a lost person need eternal life? What is eternal life? This is a track that could be a great help to you in sharing the gospel with lost people, your friends, your family, your loved ones, your workmates, your people at school, and so on. Now listen, at the end of the broadcast, Pastor Ken's going to be giving to you our mailing address. He will not give the telephone number. Let me give that to you right now. Any of these ways, I'm going to give you one, a third way in a moment, but any way you contact us, we'll give you the sample packet free of charge. The telephone number you can call, uh, you can call today during uh, regular business hours. We're on Central Standard Time, so keep that in mind, but you can call us here in Central Illinois. The phone number is area code 309 6888. Now, again, the telephone number here to call is area code 309 828 6888. You can also contact us using the internet. We have a website. You can go there. The website, the, the chunk of it, the major por portion of it, is the name of our ministry, Bible Tracks Incorporated. We just simply have abbreviated incorporated to INC Inc., okay? You can contact us at our website, which is www.bibletracksinc.org. Again, that's www.bibletracksinc.org. Again, the mailing address will be given at the end of the broadcast. I come to Psalm 25. I just love this psalm. I've used it in some different settings. I want to talk uh, today and tomorrow to people that are teachers of the Word of God. Can I do that? If you are a teacher of the Word of God, whether you're like me, you've been a pastor, you are a pastor, you're a Sunday school teacher, you work in some youth program, you teach a uh, an outreach to children, you teach a, a men's Bible study, a ladies' Bible study, whatever the case may be, if you are involved in teaching the Word of God, I would like for you to particularly pay attention. If you uh, are one who would say, you know, I would like to be able to be a teacher of the Word of God, and I think that is a goal that every believer ought to aspire 
aspire to. We want to impact others with what we know from the Word of God. We don't know everything. I don't know. I'm so far from knowing everything in the Scriptures. No preacher does, no matter how great a a scholar they are, no matter how long they've served God. Nobody knows all that's here. Uh, The Spirit of God, there's just no way for the Spirit of God to get through our, our what I often refer to as our peanut butter brains, to teach us all that is here. But I do know this, the Spirit of God wants to teach us the Word of God, and when we put ourselves at His disposal, He will communicate and help us to know, and then we can communicate that to others. As I come to the psalm here, I want to uh, remind you that there is a uh, there is a, a an old-fashioned word that we need to say. It's the word piety. If you're going to be a teacher of the Word of God, if you are a teacher of the Word of God, you need to be a pious person. I need to be a pious person. Now, that's an old-fashioned word. It's an old-fashioned idea, but it's a biblical, godly one. You say, now, Brother Mark, what is a pious person? What is piety? Well, I don't know that I have a full handle on it, but as I've looked at the Word of God and and seen what it said and read what it says about living for Christ, I think a pious person has these four traits at least uh, in their life. Number one is this. There is a reverence for God. And by reverence, I don't simply mean reverential awe, although that is certainly part of it. I think it encompasses a uh, fear of God. And uh, it means to be afraid of God, who he is, but knowing that this awesome, powerful God who hates sin, also loves sinners and made a way of escape from sin. And he wants to have a relationship and will have a relationship with us, a relationship in which he will call us his friend and communicate truth to us, but a reverence for God. Number two, that there will be a motivation in us to make God preeminent in our life to make God preeminent in our life. Give him first place. Thirdly, that you and I have a sense of serving God in every action that we do. A pious person senses that they are serving God in all that they do. You remember the New Testament, which says that we are to uh, serve the Lord. Uh, at all, uh, the Old Testament says serve the Lord at all times. The New Testament says, and whatsoever you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That's a description of a pious person. Uh, lastly, uh, a pious person is one who their, their practice of the above three things will cause them to stand out from others who are so very man-centered and self-centered. And that can include a whole lot of p- people who are really believers. Many a believer, including you and I, so often are man-centered, self-centered in our lives. But a pious person will, will stand out from the crowd, and that piety in their life will make them very conspicuous. For some, that, that conspicuousness will cause them to be attacked. But for others, that conspicuousness will cause them to be a source uh, and a resource for help and hope in their own lives. As a believer, I can go to a pious person and say, help me, I want to be like you. Well, I want to love Jesus like you. Or a lost person can come and say, you know God. It's obvious in your life you know God. I need to know God. Help me know him. Now, as we come, now I'm going to read the first seven verses here of the psalm. Psalm 25, beginning at verse 1. Under thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have ever, they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgression. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. I stop at verse 7 because I'm going to oversimplify the, the, uh, how the, the psalm is laid out. But there are three basic sections. Uh, there are seven verses, one through seven here, uh, that are, are make up the introduction. There is the last seven verses, beginning at verse 16, which make up the petition for the trouble that he's in. And then there are verses 8 through 15 in between, which really are a, uh, uh, can be further broken up into three verses, one verse, three verse, and then one verse. That is the way the Hebrew psalm is laid out. Now, I want to come here and direct this psalm at those of us who are involved in teaching the Word of God. We need to be people that are pious. Now, you say, well, how do I know if I'm a pious person? 
Well, one of the signs that piety is being developed in my life and in your life is that uh, well, where does our mind take us during our leisure moments? During our leisure moments when we haven't got anything in particular to think about, where does our mind take us? Does it take us to God and our walk with God and our relationship with him? Or do we think about selfish things uh, and sinful things? That is a signal of a pious person. Their thoughts take them to God and their walk with God. Where was David's thoughts taking him during this time? David is experiencing great trouble here. We're going to see that here in a moment. Well, let me just jump down here. Verses 16 and 17 says this, Turn thee to unto me and have mercy upon me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. O bring thou me out of my distresses. This is not the only place, but it's sure a blunt place. David, who is writing this, is in trouble. What kind of trouble? Don't know. Where is he at? Is he uh, uh, in the palace, away from the palace? We're not told. We do not know the circumstances, but I, I do know this, that David is in trouble. He's in distress. He is in affliction. Is it physical? Uh, is it a disease? Don't know. Is it is a Saul chasing him? I don't know, but I do know he's in trouble. I like not knowing because their way, therefore, no matter what trouble I'm in, I can run to Psalm 25 and say, that Psalm will work for me because I'm in trouble and David was in trouble. Now listen, where did David's mind run when he was in trouble? How do I know David was a pious person? Well, notice in verse 3, his thoughts went to prayer and meditation. Verse 3 says, Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. On yesterday's broadcast, we talked about that word wait, what it means. It means to intertwine our life and our thoughts in the Lord. Uh, yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy way, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. His mind went to uh, meditating on the, the things of God, the truth of God. You'll notice here that Dave was really concerned that in the midst of trouble, he not bring shame to his life in God. Not only that is in verse 2 and 3, but to go to verse 20, it says of the psalm, O keep my soul and deliver me, let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in thee. The bookends of this psalm is, Lord, in my trouble, don't let me be ashamed, don't let me bring shame upon you. My friend, that, that is the cause and the, and, the, and the heartbeat of your life, isn't it? It's, it's mine. I don't want to bring shame upon my life. I don't want to bring have shame in front of others, but I desperately don't want to bring shame upon my Lord and Master. Do you? No, we don't. My friend, here's a great psalm for all of us. Well, where did David's thoughts take him during this time? It took him to thoughts of confidence in God. Look at verse 2. Oh, my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. He said, Lord, I have confidence in you. You're my thought. You're my trust. You're my shield. You're my confidence. Notice his thoughts went to wanting to be directed by God and, and led by God. Verse 5, lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. Lord, I need your leading in my life. Where else did his thoughts take him? Verses 6 and 7, to forgiveness of sin. Verse 6, remember, O Lord, thy tender mercies and thy loving kindnesses, for they have been ever of old. Remember not the sins of my youth nor the transgression, according to thy, ten, thy mercies, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. My friend, do you know that God can be merciful to sinners? He'll be merciful to your sin. Whether you're a believer or you don't know Christ right, as your Savior, there's mercy and loving kindness with God about over your sin. He hates your sin, but he'll be merciful to you. Turn to him today, crowd for mercy and forgiveness of sin. Amen? Amen. We're glad you've joined us today for Bible Tract Echoes. Be sure to send your letter of encouragement today, or you may request Bible Tracts. Simply write us at Bible Tracts Incorporated, Post Office Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. That's Bible Tracts Incorporated, Post Office Box 188, Bloomington, Illinois, 61702. And thank you for being with us today on Bible Tract Echoes. May God richly bless you.